the essence of Topola had gone, snuffed out like a candle. Only the body that housed him was left lying on the stage in a pool of congealing blood, with Tattoo kneeling beside him, tears rolling down his cheeks, rocking back and forth on his heels and sobbing. Yan put a gentle hand on the dwarf's shoulder and bent down to whisper to him, We have to leave. Tetu was in a bad way. Already exhausted from doing two performances in one night, the shock of losing such a dear friend had taken all his strength away and robbed him of his senses. All Yan could think was that they must somehow get out of here. Out in the hall, the guests were making their way up the grand staircase. Cedar felt perplexed by their indifference. Surely they realised that the magician wasn't acting. Surely they realised he had been seriously hurt. Why did no one summon a surgeon to help? She turned in desperation to the Duchess. I, I think the magician has been wounded. Nonsense, child! It was just play-acting! Her eyes searched the room for more distinguished company. I can assure you that your magician will live to work another day. She walked away, leaving Cedo alone. I don't want to grow up to be like that, thought Cedo. She'd have liked to go back into the library to see for herself what had happened to the magician. But one of the Count's men was standing guard outside, and she knew that if she moved any closer, she might attract unwanted attention. Beside her stood a young lady in an elaborate pink silk dress with a hawk-nosed gentleman. Do you remember the time the Marquis bought in a fortune teller? The young lady was asking. Her admirer shook his head. Alas, I was not invited. Well, the Marquis sent his gamekeeper out into the countryside and he brought back this old gypsy. and She refused to tell our fortunes no matter how much gold she was given. She would only speak to the Marquis and no one else. Well, what did she say? It was so ridiculous it made us all laugh. She told the Marquis he would lose everything to the King of the Gypsies. Cedo, who had been half listening to this and half looking about her, caught a glimpse of light coming from under the staircase. A door opened, and a footman came through carrying a tray of champagne glasses. She knew then what she was going to do. Without giving it a second thought, she slipped through the door. She knew there must be a way through the secret corridors to the library. It was just a matter of finding the right door. Gently, Yan helped Tetu to stand, and with difficulty guided him up the spiral staircase and along the wooden gantry to the concealed door in the bookshelves. What surprised Yan was that although he himself was well aware of the danger they were in, he felt no fear. His vision was clear, colours were electric, and everything seemed sharper. Every nerve of him felt completely alive. But the concealed door was shut fast. Don't worry, I'll get you out of here, Yan said soothingly. He heard the main door of the library open and then close with a firm click. He pulled Tetu back into the shadows. Count Kalyovsky called out, I know you're both there. My man tells me there is a boy as well. There's no point hiding. Listen to me carefully. If you don't want to go the same way as Topolan, you'd better tell me how the Piero works. Yan could hear the Count walking to and fro, trying to determine where they were. I have examined the doll. It is a piece of solid wood. It could not have been worked from the inside. I am a man of science. Come now. Tell me its secret. Tattoo's small legs had started to shudder as if caught in a trap. Yan heard the scrabble of Balthazar's claws up the spiral staircase. And there was the dog staring at them with its yellow eyes, its mouth snarled back, its fangs shining bright with saliva. 
Balthazar growled. Bring them to me, commanded the Count. Jan pointed his fingers directly at the dog's eyes and spoke softly in a language that Balthazar seemed to understand. Tail between his legs, the dog went back down the stairs, whimpering. What have you done to him, Tattoo? What gypsy sorcery is this? demanded Count Kalyovsky angrily. Jan moved silently towards the banister rail. To his despair, he saw Milkai enter the room. Quickly he moved back to the darkness of the bookshelves and tried again to push with all his strength upon the concealed door. I want the dwarf, and I want that boy, said the Count. Don't let them get away. Yes, Mazdar. Milkai was already at the bottom of the staircase. For the last time, Jan tried the door. He could hear Milkai getting closer, but still the door wouldn't give. Jan would have to stand and fight. That was all that was left to him. Suddenly the door opened. Standing in the darkness of the passageway, he could see the girl. Help me, he whispered, and together they pulled Tattoo through. By the time Milkai had taken the last few steps to the top of the gantry, there was nobody there. <laughs>